Let's see. Yeah, so last time... Well, it looks like they weren't too interested in the psychedelic chocolate storyline. And the... Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, the Hattori murders didn't really catch their attention. They wound up on that whole thing with Shinru Command. They were going to break into that uh, that headquarters. But then I have all this stuff scribbled out. Oh, that's right. They wanted to get the Hanzo sword before they do any of this stuff. Give them a better chance at beating the uh, the heavy... Okay, yeah. So if they get the Hanzo sword, then they're never going to meet the guy at the Wooden Pickle. And so I can't do the storyline with the Chinese restaurant. So, we, But they could probably get, they could get across town if... I don't have the command guys, but... Oh, crap, what do I do next? I need the RPG mainframe. Wow. I gotta remember not to do the slurping. Greetings program, this is your old buddy Ingrid Bernal here. Back with another thrilling episode of the RPG Mainframe. This is RPG Mainframe episode 53, and it's a little bit of a, a hybridization of several large, messy things that have been occupying note space in my all-too-huge journal. I was so silly to get a 1,400-page journal. Why did I do that? <laughs> it just looked cool because it had a leather cover, and now I've been working on the same damn journal for three years. Anyway... I digress. So uh, thanks, everybody, for sounding off on the possible topics thread, which came up uh, at the end of last month, um, you know, like sort of digging deeper into the the well of thinking as far as what would make a great episode and what has like chunky thoughts around it. And, and a lot of these chunky topics that you guys proposing are around actually kind of difficult topics, honestly. Um, uh, a few that have caught my eye definitely that I want to do on are one is just about sort of running cyberpunk, which is a much more expansive kind of world, right? There's a lot less limitation than uh, what we commonly think of with fantasy. And then uh, by extension from that, like, uh, you know, thinking about cities that are traversable by characters and how to do city a gameplay that doesn't just wind up being hours of one person you know, role-playing to seduce the diamond vendor so that you can, <laughs> you know, do some shenanigans. You know you know how that kind of stuff might... You guys know my opinions on towns. And really, I think the, the skill of designing towns is, you know, a few orders of magnitude simpler than the concept of a city, of, of, of gameplay in a city. Like, a city is not a town. It's a, a lot gnarlier. And so there's a lot of meaty topics, and I wanted to, the more that I thought about them, and I'm writing them down, and I keep hitting dead ends in my notes, right? I would, or, or dead ends in my thinking process, which I'm sure you guys have encountered. And, and whether you're trying to run a game for a new system, you're changing z genres, you're inheriting the GM's chair from a player or vice versa, or just, it, it could be, it could be any number of, of moments in the hobby that you can hit these, these think dead ends. So you're like, okay, well, I know I have the enthusiasm. I have the time. I've got all the materials. Uh, I, I know my my tools, but I, I keep hitting dead ends of thought. And nowhere do I uh, feel myself hitting that more frequently than in sort of trying to find a balance between preparing cool stuff that I know I'm enthusiastic about and making sure that I leave room for choice for the players and not like fake little, you know, Pac-Man choices where you're, you know, either going left or right in a squiggly maze that just sort of leads to the fruit, right? But but actual choice that's going to deeply impact the themes and tone and success and failure of the underlying story elements. You know, succeeding and failing at any given task or any given combat or any given conflict in any game it is really, to me, not what, uh, you know, choice or failure and a success for players is about. It's it's do their perceived self sort of actualizations happen? Do, uh, do the, the moments that they dreamed of when they created their characters occur at all? And if they do, I feel like that's successful. And if they don't, if they're stymied from those moments occurring, then they're not successful. And it, it may not even be the same as failure. 
But as the GM facing making new blocks of gameplay or continuing blocks of gameplay, these questions, I, I hope, come up for you as much as they do for me, and they can reach dead ends of thinking. And so the topic that I wanted to talk about today for episode 53 of the uh, podcast that's made to last here on Runehammer is agency and how I can keep it in my game, but I can still prepare without this, like this paralysis and, or, or even for me, you know, I'm, I'm someone who has, you know, a lot of enthusiasm to spare for doing the hobby, right? I'm like, I'm doing this every stinking day and somewhere or another, I'm always sneaking in a few minutes here and there, either in my journal or my, my laptop. And I'm kind of, Ooh, there's a little idea. Maybe I could stow that away for later. I know that you guys and gals out there are just like that. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be dwelling up here in the frigid expanses of Northern Runeham area. And if you're like that, you're going to be hitting these moments where you're worried about, well, where's that going? Okay, so I know that they wanted the one thing, but they didn't want the other thing. And so I want to, you know, okay, but wait, they had that new plan, which I hadn't thought of, which in this case, in the sake of the example I'm going to be doing in this podcast is this Hanzo sword. Okay, my group is up against, they're like five sessions in, they've been through hell, they're up against some forces. They've got a tip from an NPC that they can acquire one of these Hanzo swords, right? This is a, a legendary sword whose steel is so fine and so balanced, it actually far outmatches any higher tech weapons of the time. They're determined that if they can acquire this Hanzo sword, and you can insert any sort of acquirable thing for a group, that their next challenge, which they're expecting to happen, is going to be, you know, swayed more in their favor, right? And so I'm trying to take all these things into account, and I'm just sitting here like, eh, just like in this podcast. I'm kind of going, eh. this, this whole topic is giving me a little bit of brain spaghetti, where I'm just looking at a tangle and I'm not sure I can find the meatball, which is going to be the fun part, the fun moment that I'm looking for. And nowhere more do I hit this spaghetti state than in this problem that I just mentioned, which is balancing, giving players real agency, giving them real choice and real control and true collaboration with me in the creation of this overall experience, but also doing the things I want to do as a GM, preparing the things, setting some themes and setting up some story beats and, and, and seeing my vision come to fruition, right? Balancing these two things is probably one of the core challenges of what we do in our hobby. And so I've got sort of, I've been thinking more um, in terms of like almost logical arguments to get these podcasts to have more meat to them, okay? So I want to walk you through the sort of premises and thesis that I've arrived at as maybe a potential answer for this fundamental challenge. How do we balance preparing gameplay, but also really allowing agency and choice. And, and I'm, I'm going to take one fundamental assumption here, which is that the, my classic answer for this has always been, we'll only prepare one session at a time. Now this looks beautiful on paper and it's been what, you know, three years now that I've been advocating that, that creative method. And I know that I I'm pretty staunch about that uh, creative method but I have to be 100% honest when I'm sitting down and I'm planning the living world games, or at least thinking about the living world games for the beginning of next year, which are set in uh, altered state in the cyberpunk universe. I'm hitting the, I don't know if I just want to plan one session. I don't know if that feels robust enough to me. And then I'm going to leave all of these questions unanswered. I'm going to have 25 or more players looking for an exciting intertwined experience. And all I'm going to do is prepare a couple hours of gameplay. Uh, that just puts my nerves to fray. I mean, <laughs> this makes me want to wiggle. And so, you know, sometimes I have to face the difficulty of my own, my own sort of axiomatic thinking, right? And this is one of those cases. I want to do more preparation than one than one session, but I really do want to allow for meaningful player choice. And in the case of the living world, group choice, which affects the next group's game. So now let's talk about balancing player agency and prep. Okay. And, and I'm kind of seeing agency really as my, my Holy grail here. Um, you know, whether or not I get to get this much prep or that much prep to me is very flexible, but I true believe we, we can't defy the, the, the fundamental pillar that the players need real agency and real choice and really do need to feel 
and truly be changing the course of events. And, and, and here's my first premise is about to emerge. Okay. So first premise is that agency is what defines tabletop RPGs, especially when you compare them to video games, which were sort of a, a, an interactive storytelling medium that is chasing behind a tabletop RPG. So agency is what defines our hobby. That's almost what I want to say here as a premise. Agency and the ability to actually change the course of things and the outcomes of things is what's so beautiful about tabletop because it's collaborative and there is no set path. There is no software which has limits to what it can show you or where it can take you. The only limit is the, the flexibility and collaborative imagination of the table. And I would say this is actually the fundamental appeal of tabletop RPGs across the board. Now, they may be a little more social in some ways. They may be a little more tactile than video games or other interactive media. But to me, those aren't the defining components. The defining component is the agency. It's the actual change power or true choice power that players have in tabletop games that defines them. Okay, so let's take that as premise one. Now let's take premise two, which is that agency or control or choice often gets short shifted in games because it's simply too much prep or too many loose ends for a GM to accommodate. So I think you guys have all had this happen to you, either as the GM or the player. And it, I guess in a flippant way, it's sometimes referred to as railroading, but I actually don't, I think railroading can be perfectly fine in, in places. But to say that railroading will then supplant choice or agency, that's when you get the sort of negative use of that term. But that term has become so loaded and flippant, I'd rather not use it. So what I want to say is just something more in-depth and thoughtful, which is that agency is something we all want, we know that, but it winds up falling short because the GMs can only account for so many things. Now, the classic place that you see this happen is like trying to create these so-called sandbox worlds. It's a sort of a holy grail, or I would actually say a golden cow of tabletop games to create a sandbox world, right? Uh, examples of these might be like hex crawl type worlds where the GM or a book or supplement of some kind has created a world and a system of movement and choice that is so thorough in its preparation that players can do anything in any direction. And, and there is, there is content there for them. I don't see this a as terribly realistic or B as terribly fun or C as terribly approachable for a GM with a limited amount of time. I don't think that the sandbox makes for a good God it's, it's to me a golden cow. But you also don't want to just say, okay, guys, uh, everyone sit back and I'm going to narrate the game. That's the hardcore version of, of no agency, right? Somewhere in between, we're going to find a really good spot. Okay, so premise one, agency is really what defines our hobby. It's the coolest thing. Premise two, the coolest thing in our hobby gets short shifted because it's hard for GMs to accommodate really a lot of really authentic choice for their players, either because of time limitations or ability or just loose ends, you know, loose ends can give you nerves. <laughs> and so what I want to do now is deliver my thesis to answer these two premises, because as you can see, they set up a real conflict here, right? The number one thing we like is being short shifted. What do we do? And my thesis is, to employ binary outcomes in your prep. It keeps agency alive, but it makes for a manageable sort of style of adventure planning. Binary outcomes. Now, it'd be easy to jump ahead a little bit in the discussion and say, well, Hankering, Ingrid, Bernal, geez, you only want there to be two possible outcomes to any given node or adventure or session probably is the best unit to use here. Only two outcomes to a session? Well, that's just diabolical. I mean, that takes away all the agency, but you need to hear me out. Hear me out. And the first caveat I want to put in is that there's going to be other details and other outcomes to every session. Anyone who has played much tabletop knows that despite the primary arc or thread or progress state of a game, there are a million other tiny details and outcomes which are tracking and rising and falling as you're going. They often involve RP. They often involve player relationships. They involve relationships with NPCs. They involve details about gear and 
progression and the state of the world, the village that burned down. Maybe the village burning down has nothing to do with acquiring the Hanzo sword, but it's still an outcome. So don't jump ahead of my statement and saying that binary outcomes are our solution by thinking they're the only ones. What I'm saying is as the GM, you're going to focus on or prepare in a mindset of binary outcomes. And this is going to give you the balance that you need. So you don't just have to plan one session and then bite your nails for a month (laughs) as you get ready to play this session. You can do more preparation by using binary outcomes, okay? So before I get into sort of what I have as sort of evidence and hints and how-tos, on doing binary prep. I want to sort of share with you guys the creative experience that I went through to reach this point. Because remember, I'm not coming at anything that we talk about here on the RPG mainframe from a standpoint of knowing it. <laughs> and everybody's just like, unsubscribe. <laughs> I thought I thought you knew about that. I thought you knew what you were doing. I've been deceived. I want my tuition back. <laughs> No, I'm mostly coming at the mainframe from a point of discovery. I haven't GM'd for almost a year now. I've just been a player in lots and lots of games. Then I started working on my Choose Your Own Adventure novel, Retune. And in the process of creating this, one of the first things I hit was like, this is insane. (laughs) The mental spaghetti in this is completely overwhelming and insurmountable. I can't deal. And so what I did, just as an experiment, I tried making binary choices at each sort of block is what they're called. So each block ends in a binary choice. And at first, it felt like short shifting to me. It felt like anemic to me. But oh boy, as the tree grows and grows and grows with these binary choices, the number of choices is so fantastic and amazing. It's just at first you, you, you hear the word binary and you think, you know, you know, one or zero, that makes me kind of sad. That doesn't feel like real choice, right? Oh boy. All you do need to do is map yourself through a little bit of storyline using binary choices and you see how insanely fast it multiplies. It's almost like the old trick of the guy who asked to have twice as many grains of rice per square on the chessboard rather than the number of grains of rice multiplied by the square. (laughs) At first, it seems like he's crazy, but by the 64th square, he has like 10 trillion grains of rice. (laughs) That was the worst retelling of a mathematic metaphor I think you're ever going to hear on a podcast. But anyways, suffice it to say, binary choice does seem limiting when you first consider it, but over time, you really see how deeply powerful it can be. And so that's where I arrived. I arrived at this point from A, not doing a lot of GMing, really no GMing for the past year almost, being a player, B, working on Retune, my Choose Your Own Adventure novel, and then C, getting ready to run a big series of games here at the end of the year and the beginning of next year. And that getting ready part is where I'm facing what I bet you guys face every single week, that good old feeling of being like, how the hell do I do this? (laughs) I kind of have a story I would like to begin to tell, but the players could be anybody and they could take it any direction. So how do I prepare? Ah, that's how I came to this binary choice thing. Okay. So that's my process. So next I want to give it a qualifier. A qualifier says, Hey, before you judge my thesis, think about some of this These are sort of qualitative analyses about what this binary choice should feel like. And this is what I realized writing Retune. For this to work, the binaries have to be really well-informed, agonizing choices with big results. So a great example of how this doesn't work is to say, go left or right. That is the worst kind of binary choice. It is simply terrible, especially if you have no context on what's to the left and what's to the right. That's not agency. That's not choice. That's just hibbity dibbity. That's just shibbity boop. That's just, uh, that's just mental flotsam. So you never want your, your story arc choice points to be arbitrary or to be uninformed in any way. You need deep informed choices or deep informed results. In this case, do they or do they not acquire the Hanzo sword? And the Hanzo sword here basically represents a a order of magnitude capability jump for the group. Do they or do they not acquire this, this, this ability jump? This to me is a huge point of choice. And the consequences 
of taking this sword could be very far reaching. Not just do they or do they don't have it. I'm sure that this sword is on some kind of insane, cool, like display case, right? With all these lasers and stuff. And yes, maybe they have the ability to take it, but when they take it, there's no alarm that they can hear. The alarms are elsewhere. The alarms are large forces moving against them. There's all these ramifications. And it's better if they know that. If they know that taking this is going to ignite all these these ramifications because then they have an informed binary outcome. Not just do you take it or not. They need to be informed. They need context. They need to, to agonize over the question. If we take the Hanzo, we become combat powerhouses, but we will arouse the dragon. If we don't take the Hanzo, we are, ha, almost stand no chance in this tactical goal that we're trying to do, but we don't make a new enemy. We don't put ourselves on the wanted list, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see how even though this is just a binary choice, if it's informed and it has context, ooh, it becomes tasty, so dang tasty. And remember, this is only the final moment of a session or sort of the core moment, the climax moment. There's a bunch of other stuff to the session. We're just focusing on the choice point that's gonna help you map your tree, your little story tree that's gonna branch downward, okay? So that's sort of qualifier number one. Now, second, I have a qualifier that is almost like a hint in a way. <laughs> and this is to directly tie your binary choice to the goal of the session. And th this is in a way as a qualifier too, to try to prove to you or show you that my thesis is legit to try to prove it to myself. The binary choice that you're mapping has to be directly tied to the goal of a session. And so almost like the dramatic questions that Kelsey uses in her adventures, this is a, an underpinning question about the outcome of a session. And you're not only going to make those, those outcomes binary in nature, but they are directly related to that entire goal, in this case, to acquire the Hanzo. Now, all of you guys, if you're writing sessions the way I think you are, there is a sort of implicit fundamental goal to a session, even if that goal was determined by players and not by you. You need somewhere to start on a session, right? You need something. You can't just be like, okay, what the hell's happening tonight? <laughs> it's, that is not terribly compelling. So what you do is you take that goal, take your perception of the goal of that session, which is to steal the Hanzo, and all you have to do to ask yourself is, what if they do and what if they don't? What if they wind up with this or what if they don't? What if they go for it or what if they don't? And then you have two outcomes and you need to know or be able to see what those outcomes could entail. They don't have to just be a singular fact either. They can each be a list of bullet points in their own right, but... You are controlling how you're thinking about the future in binary terms. Did they or did they not accomplish this session goal? Okay, if they did or if they do thinking in the future, blah, 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 blah. If they don't, blah, 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 blah. This gives you a grounding for preparing a truly divergent outcome. You're going to have two follow-up sessions in some regard prepared. So right now, you've already earned yourself the privilege of preparing three sessions rather than just the one, and you're soothing your GM nerves. And, and I'm using the word you here because I'm, <laughs> I'm honestly nervous about my own capabilities, so I should just be saying I. I'm soothing my GM nerves because now I can map out three possible sessions, one that I know is going to happen, which is the sort of the Hanzo session or the introductory session, right? And then two, which are binary opposites, which are possibles. And then for each of those, I'm going to come up with a binary possibility. So right away, using this tech, and then I'm going to stop right there. Using this technique, I now have seven sessions to plan. I've got the first, then a branch, then I've got A and B, and then I've got four branches, two from A and two from B, right? So that's four possibles. This is seven sessions now that I get to plan to make myself feel like, oh, I'm seeing where this is going to go, even if the choices go in the opposite direction at here, this point or this point. So when you get that feeling, of, at least for me, when I get that feeling, it's suddenly soothing. 
I suddenly have a good chance of seeing possible outcomes and being able to map it in a, in a, a, a conceivable way instead of just saying, wow, anything could happen right here. The players could do absolutely anything. How am I supposed to prepare what's next? Oh my God, that, that frightens me. But if I think in terms of binary results from each session, now I have seven sessions to plan to get my campaign off the ground. And that makes me feel a lot more confident going into the introductory session, the Hanzo session, as I've been calling it. And then my final qualifier in saying, I think this thesis is pretty damn good, <laughs> is, is that the real agency that you're going to give them, of course, yes, is in this binary sort of outcome. But... The really good stuff is in the how of what happens. The how of what they do per session is, is a sacred, sacred place that the GM must never, ever tread upon, ever. This is one of the most hard-lined principles that I can give you as a struggling game master, which I think we all are. I don't think there's any mastering this hobby. The how, the agency of how players do things, of how they do things is an area that the GM must never, ever tread upon. And this is why sometimes challenges with fixed resolutions are the worst ones in our hobby. Like the only way they're going to get through the city gate is if they mention the dog they found outside, right? What you just did is not only set the tone and the story and the scene, you also set the how. And so the players just grope around in the dark until you say the thing you've already determined. This is the worst form of robbing them of agency. The how must always remain perfectly sacred and in only the player's hands. And so you could critique my thesis at first by saying, binary outcome is not rich enough. That That's just not enough variability. That's not really, you know, enough agency, not enough choice. But then if you look closer and you make sure to follow that principle, that you will never tread on their choice of how they accomplish or don't accomplish their goals, you'll see that every session is jam-packed with agency. Jam-packed with agency. If you begin to prescribe how they're going to accomplish things, that's when you're really taking the control away from them. Or worse yet, if they basically do everything needed to accomplish a thing and you still take away the results, that's even worse, even more demoralizing, which I think is generally known as the, the, the flip or the, or the swoop, which is that I think we just did everything we were supposed to do and then whoops, uh, nope, that's not an RPG mainframe, that's a Rubik's Cube. And you're like, but this whole time it looked like an RPG, uh, illusion spell. Oh, man. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so you get binary agency, binary choice in the outcome of each goal or each session. And then inside of each session, you have infinite agency and choice in how things are accomplished. And you never, ever touch it as the GM. So recapping. Agency is the thing we want. It's threatened by prep. So what you do is you prepare in binary outcomes and you've solved it. Now, this does ask one difficult thing of you, which is that each session you're going to need to think of two possible outcomes. You're, you're not going to get the privilege of setting up a dungeon or a block of content that's going to take 10 sessions to complete with no sense of, of what happens when and what the goal of any given session is going to be. And well, you know, it's just so much content, it's gonna take them a while to play through it. And, well, you, you unfortunately lose that morass type approach, that sandbox approach is no longer going to be useful for you if you're trying to adopt this sort of binary approach. If you adopt the binary approach, you're going to see a tree growing. It's going to start with one blob, and that's going to have two fingers off of it. Then you're going to have two blobs, and each one of those is going to have two fingers off of it. So just in those steps, as I mentioned before, suddenly you have seven blobs to plan. Then all you need to do is ask yourself, what could be the binary condition that leads from this to that? What moments do I know I want to happen? And what could be the binary outcomes that either lead to or don't lead to those moments? And even more interestingly, binary outcomes that both lead to moments you want to see happen. Let's say that you want to see the uh, sort of bikini-clad warrior defeating an army 
and the, the uh, I don't know, the PCs have a chance of befriending this incredible sort of Conan-esque warrior woman, right? So the binary question here is, do they or do they not become allies of this impressive character? If they do, it puts a certain tone on things, doesn't it, right? You've got this Red Sonya character on your side, and there's so many different ramifications and possible story tones that go with that. If you don't, you potentially have this Red Sonia as an enemy and how many things and what interesting moments are, you know, are going to arise because of that. So just because the choice state or the, the tree node <laughs> on your plan is binary, by no means does it mean there's only sort of two possible sort of interesting parts. There's so many little interesting parts, but what you're doing is using that binary method to prepare more than one session at a time and feel confident you're still going to be ready for player squirrel hunting, for player cat herding. Because even when the players go completely bonkers, which the more high tech your game is, the easier it is for them to go bonkers, by the way. We have a freaking spaceship. We can go anywhere. <laughs> you still have this binary outcome you're going to check on. Here's a great example. They're going to either get or not get the Hanzo sword, right? Let's say they don't take the bait at all. They don't even, they actually decide, screw the Hanzo sword. They're not interested. They do this entire other session. It's a total digression. It's still okay because you have a did they or did they not approach. So you're still prepared for the next session, even though they may have completely opened several more Pandora's boxes, you still have prepared for the they didn't branch. And you at least have a sense of some moments you'd like to see happen with them not getting the Hanzo. Now, I know that this is a bit of a maple syrup topic here in uh, Runehammer 53 or mainframe 53, right? This is, this is not an easy one, but I hope you guys can see how it gives you this chance to prep more content without robbing them of their choice through that content. Now, am I right? I think I am based on my own work that I'm preparing for my, um, my campaign here, the, my, my living world campaign for all the immortals um, at the, uh, the turn of the year, which the title of that campaign or that sort of series of games is Birthday Boy. And Birthday Boy is, is for me, directly employing this method because it worked so well for me or is working so well for me while I write Retune. And I really can't wait to write more of these Choose Your Own Adventure books because it's such a fun way to play with that GM's voice, that voice that speaks in the you voice, like you turn a corner, you know, you see this, then you do that, and will you do that, and do you do that? Like this is a, a voice that's very natural for a game master, whereas for a, a traditional novel writer, it can be pretty challenging but it has felt so natural and so good. So that's where a lot of this is coming from. Now, I hope this binary method works for you guys. I, I highly recommend taking a page in your notebook and just drawing one of these little trees I described. Blob with two fingers. Each one of those blobs then has two more fingers. You've got seven blobs. And what could that be? Can that tool help you write the beginning or the next phase of your campaign in a way that retains real substantive agency and choice? but lets you plan a little bit more than just three hours of gameplay and cross your fingers. <laughs> so I hope that's helpful, you guys. A lot of thought has gone into this one. I have been circling and circling, trying to get a thesis on this that matters. And I, I really do think this is something that's going to help me plan going forward. And honestly, it feels so compelling to me, kind of belongs in ICRPG core third edition. I, I really am feeling it. Um, uh, I, I still feel the sort of nine card method as well, but something about this is really striking a chord for me and uh, I hope it strikes a chord for you guys because that's what the RPG mainframe is all uh, about. Not just knowing, but discovering. And that's what I've been doing. So I hope you guys enjoyed. There's a lot more fun topics to get through in RPG Mainframe for November and a lot of cool stuff coming together. Always awesome to see all the activity on the forums and all the daily craziness on Discord. Um, always a privilege to be a part of this super cool community. Can't wait for the winter to, to unfold before us and, uh, you know, get into all kinds of new games and new wackiness. You guys, this is Ingrid Bernal. I'm going to sign off. That's all I got for now. I'll see you all on the internet. Strength, honor, and beer. 
I'll be right here. I'm out.